Hello class. So in this video, we'll continue on chapter six, talking about the Laplace transform. And I did check and we're still on section 6.1. Okay, so all of these videos up until now, we're still on section 6.1 in the book. So in the previous video, we saw this theorem. Right? So we saw how, or I gave you the Laplace transform of a bunch of common functions that we're gonna be working with. And I said, as long, um, unless it's stated otherwise, basically unless I tell you to use the definition of the Laplace transform to calculate a Laplace transform, if you have to calculate the Laplace transform of any function here, you can just use this here. And again, you're gonna have this for the exam because it's open book and I'm, I'm also gonna include it, you know, as a, as a page, of, as a formula page. So it's all, you know, in one single place and I have to shuffle all, all over. And as I mentioned, there are some conditions on S, right? We've, so we've seen a couple of them for in previous examples. Right? For example, S having to be greater than zero. We're gonna see more conditions on S in the, in the, in right now in this video. But as I said, for the most part, when we actually use the Laplace transform to help us solve differential equations, we're not gonna be interested in what the values of S are, just in these as expressions, not as functions, but just as expressions. Why? Because we're going to be looking to solve for S, right? So that's a little bit in the future. But the idea is we're going to take the Laplace transform of a differential equation, get, get a bunch of expressions of S, and then solve for S. So it's just an algebra problem. It doesn't really matter what these things are as functions, right? But in the theory, especially in determining for what functions do, does a Laplace transform exist, it is important that there are assumptions on the S values. And again, you're, you're going to see some of those assumptions in, these, in this video here. Okay, so let's start talking about when does the Laplace transform of a function exist? Can we find a property such that if a function satisfies this property, then we're guaranteed that the Laplace transform exists? Well, it turns out that there is such a property, and it's basically this definition. Okay, so a function f of t is said to be of exponential order if there exists constants a, k, and m, where a is arbitrary, m is greater than or equal to zero, and k is greater than zero. So let me make that more clear. Maybe here is a summary. So a is arbitrary, m is, or let's use k first, a is greater than zero, and m is greater than or equal to zero. So if there exists constants a, k, and m satisfying these conditions such that the magnitude or the absolute value of f of t is less than or equal to k times e to the a t for all t greater than or equal to m. Okay. Now I'm going to talk, you know, this mantle, this, this formula, what, what this inequality is actually saying part by part and how the variables interact. But just looking at this expression here, you can think of this as saying that the function f of t grows at a rate less than or equal to a constant times an exponential, right? And so that's what it means, right? The growth of our function is at most, or our function grows at most as fast as a constant times an exponential. And there are functions that grow faster than exponentials. For example, the factorial function grows faster than the exponential function, right? So, so not all fun of functions satisfy this. And I'm gonna show you examples of functions that don't satisfy this condition, right? But in terms of just this thing that I underlined in green, you wanna think of, okay, we're looking at functions who grow, whose growth rate is at most as fast as a constant times the growth rate of exponentials. That's how you wanna think of that in practice, okay? Now, how do the variables a, k, and m interact? Well, the M is telling you basically, okay, maybe this formula or this inequality doesn't work for all T's, right? So it's saying, okay, maybe it works only for T's greater than or equal to five, for example. So in that case, your M would be five, right? So M is just telling you for which, uh, for which values of T does this inequality hold, right? So think of M as affecting the domain of the function T. Right. Remember, we're only interested in values of t greater than or equal to zero, right? So m is going to be greater than or equal to zero. It either works for all t's, right? For all t greater than or equal to zero, or it only works for t's, you know, eventually. So maybe for t's greater than or equal to five, greater than or equal to ten, etc. So that's what m is doing. 
K is just this constant because it might be that our function grows faster than an exponential, but if you multiply it by a constant, then now it grows either equal to or less than as fast as that exponential. So that is all that K is doing, and the same with A. It might be that our function grows faster than, than AT for some values of A, but it grows at most as fast as either the AT times K for some values of A. Right. This, this is kind of like the degrees of freedom when we were doing the method of undetermined coefficients. Right? We want us to find values of k and a for which this holds, and we're going to play with these values right, until we find values of k and a for which this works, and m as well. Right? So think of k, a, and m as being degrees of freedom. And as long as you can find such values, whatever they are, then the Laplace transform of this function exists. Right. So it's a little bit maybe theoretical at first, so let's do a couple examples. So example three, the functions t, e to the negative t, and two cosine t are all of exponential order. Why? Why? Well, because you can bound the absolute value of these functions like this. You can show very easily that the absolute value of t is less or equal to e to the, uh, e to the t. So let's see what the variables are in this case. And, and these hold for all t greater, greater than or equal to zero, right? So this inequality here is saying that what? Well, it's saying that, okay, so what's our a, m, and k? Since this works for all t greater than or equal to zero, it means m equals zero. There is a constant in front of the exponential. It's just a constant one, which means k equals one. And there's a constant in front of the t in the exponent, which is 1. So this means a equals 1. So here what I did is I found specific values of m, k, and a for which this inequality holds, which means that t is of exponential order, right? which means that the Laplace transform exists. Right? So that's the next theorem. Right? So, so I'm basically going a little bit ahead. But at least it says that our function is of, is of exponential order, right? meaning that it grows at most as fast as a constant times an exponential. Okay, so that's the first one. Let's look at the second one. So e to the negative t, I'm saying that this is less than or equal to e to the t. And this is obviously true, you can see it graphically. And you can see that this holds for all t greater than or equal to zero. For example, what do the graphs look like? Well, one looks like this, that's the one with positive t as the exponent, and the other one looks like this. Oops, sorry, I went two down. The other one looks like this. Right? That's the one with t with a negative exponent. Right? So you can see that clearly just from the graph, e to the t is always greater than or equal to e to the negative t in absolute value. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means that, okay, let's look at our specific constants that we found. Since, again, this works for all t greater than or equal to zero, that means m equals zero. k, again, is in there, it's just one. And a, again, is in there, but it's just one. Okay. Finally, one more example. Let's look at two cosine of t. Here, I gave you that this is always for all t, this is less than or equal to 2 times e to the t, right? For all t greater than or equal to 0. Now, how can you see this? Well, you can think of this as, so let me do an argument, because this one is not as easy to see as the other ones. Right? The other ones are kind of straightforward. You can just see graphically. Okay. What is going on here? Well, first, there's a property of absolute values that means that you can, whenever you have a product in an absolute value, you can just separate as the absolute value of each term. So this is the same as absolute value of 2 times the absolute value of cosine of t. Okay, Absolute value of 2 is just 2 because 2 is positive. So this becomes 2 times the absolute value of cosine of t. Okay. Now, we actually have a bound for the absolute value of cosine of t. Why? Because of this expression. So let me give you something else. So you should have seen in algebra, but you know, maybe you haven't for a long time. So let me give you the 
theorem here, or the formula, whenever you say that the absolute value of some expression, let's say f of t, is less than or equal to some constant, let's say c, that's the same thing as saying that without the absolute values, your function is bounded above and below by negative c and c. So that's what it means whenever you write the absolute value of a function or an expression, it's less than or equal to some constant, it's the same, or other functions, the same as saying that your expression is bounded above or below by the positive and the negative of whatever you had on the right-hand side. Now, we know a bound like this for cosine of t. Remember that the range of cosine is at most one and, a, and at least negative one, meaning that the absolute value of cosine of t is less than or equal to one, just using this definition here, which actually I should box. So it's more clear to see. Right. And this is for all t. Okay. Now I'm gonna apply this to this to show that this is true, right? This inequality is actually true. Okay, so notice that, uh, so I guess this is all the work we need. Uh, so I'm just going to leave it like this. Okay, so I'm going to justify this inequality using this work on the right and what we have here. Right? So let me re rewrite the work. So let me write because this, as we saw, is equal to 2 times the absolute value of cosine of t. The absolute value of cosine of t is less than or equal to 1. Right? So this is less than or equal to 2 times 1. right? And this is less than or equal to 2 times e to the t. Why? Because e to the t is greater, greater than or equal to 1 for all t greater than or equal to 0. And that is where that formula comes from. And that's usually how you prove these things, kind of like how you, you would prove a trig identity or how you would prove that a function is linear. Right? You start with the left-hand side and do a series of inequalities until you get onto something that has the right form on the right-hand side. Okay. So that's how you would justify something like this. What are our constants in this case? Well, in this case, again, this works for all t greater than or equal to zero, so m equals zero. K in this case is two, and A is still one. So that is how you would usually show that a function is, um, what is it called? That a function has exponential order, or is of exponential order. Right? You would start with the absolute value on the left-hand side, do a bunch of inequalities until you have something on the right-hand side that has the right form, identify your M, K, and A, and then by definition, you have shown that your function is of exponential order. Again, that means that it grows at most as fast as a constant times an exponential. 